true murder. It's a rare insight into a killer's tortured mind. The most shocking killers in true crime history. Victims were, were brutalized, shot, stabbed. And the authors that have written about them. Easy, Bundy, Dahmer, The Night Stalker, BTK. Every week, another fascinating author talking about the most shocking and infamous killers in true crime history. True Murder, with your host, journalist and author, Dan Zupanski. Good evening. When the Moon Turns to Blood examines the culture of end times paranoia in a trail of mysterious deaths surrounding former beauty queen Lori Vallow and her husband, gravedigger turns doomsday novelist Chad Daybell. When police in Rexburg, Idaho, perform a wellness check on seven-year-old J.J. Vallow and his sister, 16-year-old Tylee Ryan, both children are nowhere to be found. Their mother, Lori Vallow, gives a phony explanation, and when officers return the following day with a search warrant, she, too, is gone. As the police begin to close in, a larger web of mystery, murder, fanaticism, and deceit begins to unravel. Vallow's case is sinuously complex. As investigators prod further, they find the accused Black Widow has an unusual number of bodies piling up around her. When the Moon Turns to Blood tells a gripping story of extreme beliefs, snake oil profits, and explores the question, if it feels like the world is ending, how are people supposed to act? The book that we're featuring this evening is When the Moon Turns to Blood, Lori Vallow, Chad Daybell, and the story of murder, wild faith, and end times. With my special guest journalist and author, Leah Sotili. Welcome to the program, and thank you very much for this interview, Leah Sotili. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much, and congratulations, as I mentioned, on this incredible book. First off, just tell us briefly how you came to want to write this story, and we're in a position to write this book. Sure. So in December 2019, I started to hear about the case of Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell. This was occurring in Idaho. I'm a reporter that spends most of my time writing about the Northwestern United States and really caught my attention beyond the fact that Lori and her husband Chad were missing and her children were missing was that someone said that they thought that it might have to do with her strange cult-like religious beliefs that their disappearance maybe could be attributed to some sort of ideology that she held. And that kind of raised my flag because I write predominantly about extremism, political and religious extremism. And I knew that Lori Vallow is a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And I had written some about the fringes of the church. So it seemed like there might be some knowledge that I had that was familiar to me. And it turned it turned out I was right. There were things about Lori Vallow's story and about the things that Chad Dabell wrote about that had come up before in my own reporting. So tell us how you start the book and what story you tell in the beginning. So I tell a story in the beginning of how when I was a young reporter, I worked in the city of Spokane, Washington, and a really horrific case of murder happened in our coverage zone involving a little girl named Shasta Groney. It was a terrifying case that her family had been murdered and her and her brother were kidnapped. And for months, no one knew where they were. And it was a really formative time in my life. I was becoming a reporter. I was learning how to do that job, which so much of it is done on the job, learning how to do the work of journalism. And that case really stuck with me because it seemed like they would never be found again. And then in July 2005, Shasta Groney was found. She was found with the killer of her family in a diner in a small North Idaho town. And the story that unfolded was was worse than anyone could imagine. It was just this horrific case of abuse and, you know, mind control and murder. And it was just more horrible than anyone else could imagine that it would be. And that case really stuck with me. And at the time, I really just didn't have the ability to report on something like that. But I did feel like I needed to know how to report on something terrible because it would inevitably happen again. And so the case of Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell very quickly reminded me of that case in the same way that there were two missing children, 
Their faces were being shown everywhere on television. No one had any idea where they were. And it also happened in Idaho, a very different part of Idaho. So I start the book with that story, kind of giving that background. Now, you say that uh, it was many years later and you were working, writing about other things when the faces of two children appeared on your screen. Tell us about this incident. Right. So I, you know, about 15 years elapsed between when the the affair with Shasta Groney happened and when the case of Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell came into my life. In that time, I started to specialize writing on far-right extremism, particularly in the United States West. That work has entailed writing about preppers and survivalists, right-wing militia groups, anti-government groups, sovereign citizens, all kinds of people that make up the very unique ecosystem of the far right in the Western United States. And in that work, I started writing more about religious extremism, particularly during the COVID-19 pandemic. There were different evangelical preachers that I was writing about that were pushing, using COVID to push far-right ideologies. So I saw these, you know, in my regular news cycle of reading reading the, the headlines, I saw these two photographs of these two children pop up in my feed. And those children were J.J. Vallow and Tylee Ryan, Lori Vallow's children. And I pretty quickly got to work and realized that it was something that was well within my expertise, but a story that I felt like wasn't being told completely. So in attempting to write that completely, you say that it is vital to understand the workings of the Latter-day Saints and what they believe. And the book of Revelation is important to understand this story as well. So tell us about that. Sure. What I, you know, I grew up in Oregon. So I grew up in firmly in the Western United States and have lived my whole life in the Western United States. And New Mormons my whole life. And when I started writing about extremism, I would hear about the way that Mormons were characterized. And it was very different from the people that I knew. You know, what I came to learn was that I grew up around people who were very mainstream Mormons, but there is this extremist fringe of the church that has birthed many splinter sects, many fundamentalist movements that really don't resemble at all what the mainstream Mormon church is. And that's that's what this book gets into. So I felt like to understand Chad and Lori's Mormon belief systems, you have to understand mainstream Mormonism. That is a very recent religion. It's, you know, only about 200 years old. And it is firmly grounded in a part of the Bible, the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is a very, I mean, it's a fascinating book of the Bible in that, you know, I like to say that if that if the book of Revelation were a modern day movie, it would be directed by Michael Bay. You know, right, it's got explosions yeah. and blood, you know, falling from the sky and oceans turning red and people's skin melting off. And the, the book of Revelation is about the end the end of days. And the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, that, that name, Latter-day, suggests the end and times. Having said that, the Mormon religion is very much about talking and thinking about these, you know, what could happen and preparing for, for what could be a theoretical end of the world and living in a wholesome enough way to then be able to go into the celestial kingdom, which is their belief about heaven to kind of reduce it down and to, you know, be good citizens and good stewards and, and to have a family that will then follow you into the next life. So that I really get into the book of Revelation in the in the book to under so a reader can understand the foundation of the LDS religion, but also understand how many, many millenarian groups, which are otherwise known as cults by the, the public, right. how those groups have also used the book of Revelation to really scare people into submission. So I talk a lot about how there have been, you know, breakaway LDS sects who have used the book of Revelation in that way. There have been, you know, Charles Manson, the famous American serial killer right. who got people to do his bidding for him, very much invigorated by the book of Revelation. So I just want to be really clear that what Lori Vallow and Chad Debo believe is not mainstream Mormonism. They believe themselves to be a part of the mainstream Mormon church, but they were entertaining this fringe ideologies that have existed at the edges of the church for a long time that the mainstream church continually says, do not entertain these ideas. These are not what we believe, but they very much were doing that. The book title is When the Moon Turns to Blood. Tell us its relation, this term in the book of Revelations. 
So there are several things that happen in the book of Revelations. There's sort of this gradual unfolding of everything in the landscape changing in a way that is not beneficial to humans, that doesn't nurture human life anymore. So like I said before, rivers turn from water into blood, the bounty from all the trees that humans need to survive, to eat, to nourish themselves falls away and rots. And the moon turns to red. It goes red. It turns to blood. And this was something that the prophet and founder of the LDS church, Joseph Smith, he wrote about in his foundational documents for the church, that the moon turns to blood. The title is also a riff on a very fringe piece of LDS literature called And the Moon Shall Turn to Blood. And that is seen as a very scary book by a lot of people. It was something that predicted apocalypse. It predicted the fall of humanity. And it was really kind of sort of book that would be found in households, maybe in the 70s and 80s, where people really entertained these fringe ideas that they were going to be the survivors of the apocalypse and the one, the chosen ones that would weather that storm. What part of, explain the part of the LDS philosophy with this personal relationship with God and a more special sort of communication with God? So, one big thing that's very that makes Mormonism very unique and special in a way is that the leaders of the church teach people that you can receive revelation from God. This, I think, is is a way of saying that you will have a very unique and personal relationship to God. Maybe even feel like you can talk to God. You know, I think that's something that can be shared in many ways by lots of Christians and. The LDS Church says is that you may receive revelation from God that feels like very firm direction about maybe what you should do or a problem you're having. But they're very clear to say, if you receive revelation from God, go ahead and keep it to yourself. Maybe share it with your wife. Right. Maybe share it with your your, your you know your partner, your your children. But that revelation should not walk out the front door because when it does, and you start to say, "I'm speaking to God," then you're subverting really the hierarchy, hierarchical structure of the LDS church. Because the way it works is that the the LDS leadership is, is like a pyramid. So at the very, very top of that pyramid is one man, the president of the LDS church. And that president is seen as the living, breathing prophet, the only person within Mormonism that has a direct line to God and the only person that's allowed to receive prophecy and revelation for the entire church. So when, you know, a man in a small town in Utah starts to say, I'm receiving revelation and begins publishing that, as Chad Daybell started to do with his books, that is that is seen as very controversial. It can be even grounds if it goes too far for excommunication. And this is one very unique aspect of Mormonism, this receiving of revelation that is makes it a vibrant faith, it makes it a very attractive faith to people, but it also makes it a little bit of a tough thing to keep in the bag because some people believe that they receive revelation that affects a lot of people. They think that they see, you know, in this case, that the world could collapse and they're receiving direction on how to weather that. And I talk about in the book that if you believe you're receiving revelation like that, you might take a chance and take that out the front door to let other people know. Let's talk about the early life of Chad Daybell and the influence from his parents and the church itself, Barry Cox and his wife. And Talk about his siblings and their life growing up. Sure. Do you want me to talk about Chad Daybell or Lori Vallow? Because the Coxes are Lori's family. Oh, pardon me. Sorry. Uh, talk about uh, the Daybells. Pardon me. Sure. So Chad Daybell grew up in a small town south of Salt Lake City, about 45 minutes away, called Springville, Utah. Raised in a, you know, very traditional Mormon family. A few brothers and a sister parents who were very religious. You know, his dad at one point was a bishop in their local ward. He grew up, you know, really being a, by all means a very normal Mormon person. You have to understand in some of these towns in Utah, they are like 90, 90, 95% LDS. So, so really Chad Daybell's community was the LDS community. And, um, you know, he went on to kind of go on the track that a lot of LDS men do. He went to Brigham Young University in Provo, which is just a few minutes north of where he grew up. Um, that is the church, church run university. He worked at the student paper there. He went on a mission 
in New Jersey, which is a very traditional thing for a Mormon man to do. The church dispatches missionaries all over the world to sort of spread the gospel of Mormonism. And he did that. He came back home to Springville, Utah. He met a woman that also went to his high school named Tammy. They were married. They were married in Mormon temple and they started to have children. So by all means, you know, for much of his life, it was very, you know, very typical, very kind of by the book when it comes to LDS folks. You start to see a turn at a certain point when Chad started to write his own fiction which was a dream of his. He started to publish fictional books that that really dealt in kind of started to dabble a little bit more in this fringe in this sort of scary apocalyptic version of, of, of events. And book by book, he started to say, you know, these things that I'm talking about seem to have be happening. And then, you know, in the next book, he would start to kind of say, I don't think it's any accident. I think I'm starting to kind of predict these things. And then, of course, he, he starts to write about his own near-death experiences, mm-hmm. which is, is sort of this own subculture that I discovered in the reporting of this book that's also really controversial in the church, which is people who believe that they have died and come back to life. And you'll often see within the LDS church, this begets authors who say, you know, I'm bringing back knowledge that we need to know. I can see beyond the veil. I can speak to our ancestors and I can predict what might happen. And again, this is very controversial, but despite the controversy, these near-death experience authors sell a lot of books. They're very popular within more and circles. And I think Chad Daybell saw an opportunity there, a potentially a financial opportunity to start pushing himself as a near-death experience survivor, somebody who could see beyond the veil and who should be listened to. The LDS has a history of, I would say, people speaking about the end times and, and not very much like Christians would say, this was very urgent talk. Was that in in the incorporation into his novels for Chad Daybell? It's essential. I don't think Chad Daybell would have been a novelist without this sort of surmising of what the end times could look like and what they might you know, the things that might occur before they happen. It's it's something that's been very difficult for the LDS church to sort of reconcile because when you firmly ground your faith in this idea that the end times could come, that really can scare people. And within the last few years, church church leadership, the apostles of the church have given speeches where they've said, look, you should go have children, have grandchildren, get a college education, buy a house, go, you know, do the things you want to do. Take your focus off of this idea that that doom and gloom are coming for you. And it's a message that was heard by the majority of the LDS church. But again, this fringe element, this sort of survivalist, prepper, near-death experience, fringe of the church, it's really the extremists who, who kind of didn't want to hear it. And that's something that we start to see with Chad's writing, with his starting to get more and more cozy with other near-death experience authors to start going and speaking on the prepper circuit and attending these conferences and hosting podcasts where talking about what the end times might look like. That really, really starts to escalate more. And it really starts to put distance between Chad Daybell's traditional Mormon upbringing and where he ended up and where he is now. You talk about him also being censored and spoken to by the officials at LDS for some of the things that he writes about. But also, tell us about what marriage really entails in LDS. So marriage is one of the things that is very central to the to the LDS faith. Marriage and marriage meaning between a man and a woman. The LDS faith has a major issue on its hands when it comes to same-sex relationships. It's something that is not seen as appropriate in the church and is really, really a point of controversy right now. So in, in its I believe 1995 proclamation to the world on family. The church is very clear that that the family is the center of the faith. It is the way the faith continues. It is the way, you know, individuals, you know, you have a family, you have children that doesn't just end on this this life that that transcends into the eternal life into the celestial kingdom. So family, family is really everything. And, you know, as we see in the story that, that I wrote, that, that was also the center of, of Lori Vallow's life was this sort of continual 
a search for a husband that would that would work for a marriage that would work to have children and to kind of you know lead you see sort of a a desperation on, on both of their parts just to really lead that mainstream Mormon life. And and really, they, they both did to an extent, but I believe it sort of acted as a mask for their more nefarious intentions and extremist ideologies. Let's talk about Barry Cox and her father and Janice Connor and the how Lori Vallow grew up and her sure. background. So Lori Vallow grew up in a very different place than Chad Daybell, whereas he grew up kind of in the, you know, uh, the breadbasket, I guess you could say, of the LDS church right there in Utah. Lori Vallow grew up in in Rialto, California, in the San Bernardino area, very much a California girl living in a beautiful modern home in a planned kind of country club community. And she was the daughter of Barry Cox and Janice Connor who met when they were young in high school. Barry Cox was somebody who was seen as a little bit of a, a paragon of the community. He ran for city council. He sold life insurance policies through a church, Mormon church-owned company. And again, they, they had vied for the traditional Mormon family. They got married. They had children. He had a good job. Janice, the mother, did what LDS mothers are expected to do. She was a nurturer. She stayed home. And they had they had several children. Lori grew up, you know, going to she was a softball player. She became a cheerleader. She was seen as very beautiful, very popular in high school, but also somebody who was really kind. You know, people told me stories about how she would drive everyone to lunch in her car. They'd all go to Taco Bell together. She also was raised very devout before school. Every morning before high school started, she would go to an LDS seminary before you know her regular classes and take LDS teachings in the morning. So she was very much raised in the church and taught to be a Mormon mother. And yeah, that's kind of, that's where her story started. Now, Barry Cox is very interesting because when he ran for city council, you sort of see a very early days kind of maybe Tea Party-esque, maybe libertarian sort of ideology coming from him where he said, you know, there's just too much government. If I was to win, you know, we would kind of get rid of a lot of that stuff. You know, he didn't win. He didn't win that election. But later on, I start to dig into writings that he did that really entertained quite a bit of fringe ideas about the LDS people being the chosen people who would weather the end times and who would save the Constitution from the brink of ruin. You talk about the rise of the white horse prophecy as well. Right. This was something, white horse prophecy is is fascinating. It came into my life when I was writing a bit about the Bundy family, which was a very high profile family that led to very public anti-government armed standoffs with, with the federal government, once in Nevada and once in Oregon. And I asked them at one point if they thought that their actions against the government were inspired by the white horse prophecy. It was something I had heard about. And they told me yes. So this was when I started to understand the white horse prophecy is not a prophecy. In fact, it's a fake prophecy. The LDS church hierarchy says it is not acceptable. It is not something that was that Joseph Smith said. It's fake. It's an urban legend. And yet, despite the LDS church saying this is not what we believe. After I did my reporting on the Bundys, I started to hear a lot from people who said this is more mainstream than you think, that more people in the United States believe this than than you would think. And, And what what the White Horse Prophecy says is that in the end times, the Constitution will be whittled down so much, it will be the point of ruin. It will hang by a thread as fine as silk fiber, and it will be to the White Horse, aka the Mormon people, to save it. So it really, what you see there is not just religion, but sort of a braiding together of patriotism and country with the LDS religion. And that's been very attractive in recent years to people who are extremists. That's been attractive to, was attractive to the Bundys. So that was a big aha moment for me when I found a piece of writing that Barry Cox put out about his anti-government ideologies, his anti-tax ideologies, believing that the IRS is fake and using the language of the White Horse Prophecy, particularly the Constitution hanging by a thread. When I found that, it made me understand that Lori Vallow was perhaps raised in a household that was entertaining some fringe before that was a thing we were all talking about in the news. You talk about Lori Vallow and how she grew up and what she heard and was potentially influenced by, but, but by 2004, she 
had changed her name to, she had been married to Mr. Ryan mm-hmm. and she appeared on Wheel of Fortune and she was a hairdresser in Austin, Texas. So she was not all caught up uh, very much like Chad Daybell at that time in 2004, was she? Absolutely not. I mean, whereas Chad Daybell was sort of living that very traditional family, you know, LDS lifestyle right there in Utah. Yeah, Lori, Lori Vallow was very much living the California dream. You know, she's she was model. She was someone who had competed in beauty pageants. You have to picture this woman. I mean, she's the what is seen as the classic beauty in America. Blonde hair, blue eyes, very thin, very fit, big, bright white smile. And in 2004, she was a contestant on Wheel of Fortune. She talked about her kids, you know, in her introduction to Pat Sajak. And she was working as a hairdresser in Austin, Texas at that point and married to a man named Joseph Ryan, who was the father of her daughter, Tylee Ryan. You say that the marriage was was great. It looked like a 4,500 square foot home. But in three years, the, the marriage was soured. What were some of the accusations in the custody battle? The custody battle was was very messy. You know, I want to be clear. There are there are points when in this story that Lori Vallow is very much the aggressor, that, that evidence yeah. shows, you know, her own actions. But she had a series of marriages that did didn't seem so great. And marriage number three to Joseph Ryan was was one of them. Joe Ryan was a businessman, very good looking guy. They were seen as a beautiful couple, but things were very tense. His own sister has talked a lot about how her brother had a temper. He would punch holes in walls. He would, you know, really, really lose it over over pretty small things. So Lori Vallow in their in their divorce alleged that Joseph Ryan molested her children. So at that point when when she married Joseph Brian, she had a son named Colby, and then they had Tylee together. And she alleged that that Joseph Ryan molested both children. And it's interesting because a lot of time has passed since those allegations were made. It's something that even went to trial, you know, which is not not normal when it comes to these civil cases. And it was never found to be true. Even today, mental health professionals that worked on that case, they appeared on Dateline and they told the reporters, we still to this day think that Lori Vowell made that story up, that she planted that story in her children's heads. There was just never any evidence to prove it. But even right. so, even even when Joseph Ryan was granted some custody of Tylee, she continued to tell Tylee and other people that he had molested her and that he was a really bad guy. She told somebody in particular about these abuse allegations and that person took it upon themselves to do something. Who was that? That was her brother. So Lori had a couple of brothers and a sister and her brother, Alex, and her, I read a lot about how Alex Cox and Lori Bell had a very unique relationship. She saw him as something of a guardian angel in her life and tended to call call Alex when she needed something. And she also told this story, true or not true, about Joseph Ryan molesting her her children to her brother. And at one point, Joseph Ryan, after all was said and done with the court proceedings, he was allowed to see Ty Lee. And the way that began was he would go see her in a neutral facility. So that way, you know, there could be people monitoring their meeting and that kind of thing. So he he went and saw Ty Lee one day and he was leaving the facility afterwards, walking out to his car. And Alex Cox was there waiting for him. And, you know, they traded words and Alex Cox pulled out a taser and tased Joseph Ryan. And this really dramatic scene unfolds. You know, he gets tased, he falls to the ground, he gets up, he runs away. Alex Cox chases him in the parking lot. He tases him again. Joseph Ryan falls again and fractures his wrist. And, you know, he's screaming, you know, call the police, call the police. And nearby people hear and call the police. And Alex Cox walks away and gets in the car, drives away. He later, you know, is found that he assaulted Joseph Bryan and he does prison time for this. But all the while, you know, he's writing to friends from jail saying, you know, I need you to send me Joseph Bryan's address. I need you to send me a photo of him. He became obsessed with Lori's ex-husband and this idea that that he believed that he was a child molester and that, that he needed to do something to fix that. You talk a little bit about Alex and he is a contrast in character. He's a truck driver, I believe, you right, but also he has something that he does on the side he's very serious about as well. Yeah, he's he's you know, in this story of very traditional Mormon people, Alex Cox is the opposite of that. Like you said, he he drives truck for a living. 
he's also a stand-up comic. The interesting thing is that he tells these tells jokes on barroom stages, but he maintains his faith all the while. He doesn't swear. He doesn't drink or anything like that. And that makes him kind of unique. He's he's big on doing impressions of cartoon characters or, you know, Mrs. Doubtfire and things like that. Not by all means, is seen as, as a very funny guy, but a very strange guy. Somebody that even his own family members said, there's just something kind of off about him. And there was something kind of off about his relationship with Lori. It really seemed like he would do anything that she said. You talk about April 2018. There is a smell from Joe Ryan's Phoenix apartment. A neighbor calls the police to do a welfare check. What do they find? What's his condition? Yeah, so very sadly, Joseph Ryan is found dead in his apartment. And the police, you know, pretty quickly deduce that they think that he had maybe a heart attack and he died. He did not have a lot of people around him. He didn't have, you know, no one lived with him. He didn't have real friends or or family. He really only lived in Phoenix. He'd moved there from Texas because he wanted to be close to his daughter, Tylee. And he had the ability ability to see her. He had custody of her. So at that point, Tylee had actually severed her relationship with her father, really, really, really disliked her, her dad. And so there was just no one to know. And police believe that he had been there dead for a few days by the time they found him. You know, they pretty quickly processed the scene and, and just said, well, it's the guy who just died. And and uh, and that was that. But that story kind of comes back later in my book as a as maybe a curiosity. Maybe, maybe it wasn't that clean cut. Now, Leah, we were speaking Speaking about the mysterious death of Joseph Ryan, and but police conclude that, and with an autopsy, he had a heart attack. You talk about, or you write about, pardon me, voices in 2017. Again, about Chad Daybell. You, we had already, you'd already mentioned about the podcast that he was doing and the people that he was aligning with. There were near death experienced authors. Tell us where Laurie is at this time that Chad is rising in this community with his books and his podcasts. So Laurie is living in a suburb of Phoenix, Arizona at this point and is, you know, going about, going about the business of her life. She is nurturing her children as, as she is meant to. She becomes very involved in her church. She teaches Sunday school. She is very active. She helps friend who has a nonprofit that helps refugees move into apartments. You know, she helps set those up. When people are down on their luck, she shows up sometimes on their doorstep with money and, and gives them to them. So by all, all means is seen as a very generous member of her church and a very faithful person. But it's around this time that she also starts to entertain these podcasts about people who claim they have near-death experiences and the ability to see beyond the veil. She starts to kind of read more about these these fringe ideologies that, that we've talked about that have sort of long simmered at the edges of the church. And she starts to attend these conferences. So there are conferences helmed by several organizations that largely take place in Idaho, Utah, and Arizona. And they are really devoted to this extremist right-wing part of the fringe. So we're talking about the fringe of the fringe at this point. And these are people who are preppers, you know, which is something that's very much encouraged by the LDS church, but they're extreme preppers. Mm -hmm. They're prepping because they believe the world could end at any moment. They're they're talking about things like, you know, the quote unquote elect, which is sort of code word for the people who will be chosen by God um, or chosen by the church to, to sort of survive the perils of the book of Revelation. She starts to really kind of spiral further and further down this funnel, starting with near-death experiences, getting into these conferences, meeting more people, assembling in a, a community around her that also is willing to entertain these ideas. And then pretty quickly starts having her own home meetings with other women who are interested in these ideas and want to hear more about them. You hear you hear people use the language of leveling up their faith that maybe, you know, they, they're not getting enough in church on Sundays or by going to the temple. They want something more. And this is this is specifically something that church leadership, mainstream LDS church leadership has said that is it, that is a big red flag for them that when people want more than what they feel they're being offered in church that that's something that's when when it starts to get a little dangerous. And that's that's sort of the area that Lori is treading in. She is married to a person named Charles Vallow, and he has been asked to convert as condition of marriage 
just as Joseph Ryan was to con- convert to LDS. So he didn't grow up with this. So right. what does he think about this emerging interest that his wife has? You know, it's really interesting because Charles Vallow, he becomes, you know, he, he's very also very well known in, in their local church and and very well liked. And when Lori starts talking about some of these ideas that she's finding, some of these books that she's reading and the podcasts that she's listening to and these people that she's starting to really idolize, she starts to tell Charles some really odd things, particularly that she doesn't need to eat or sleep anymore, that she that she's sort of believing herself to be transcending human, you know, basic human needs. She starts going to the temple every day. She starts to believe that she can control things with her mind. And as their marriage starts to fall apart, she starts to become really threatening. She says that he's been possessed by a dark spirit. She starts calling him by a new name of which he has no understanding what that means. He, she says, you know, he needs to be careful that she could kill him if she needed to, that she was a goddess. And so all of a sudden he finds himself, you know, sort of his head is spinning saying, what happened to you? What happened to my wife? And and Charles starts to kind of try and ring alarms. He talks to people at church and says, you know, why is she saying these things? This is really weird. He talks to her family and no one will listen to Charles. You know, Lori is, is very manipulative and starts to tell people, you know, he's trying to be controlling of me. And, you know, if you take away the religion from this, you just have a story of two people's marriage falling apart. But with Lori Vallow, it becomes something stranger because the one of the reasons their marriage starts falling apart is because she's entertaining these extremist ideologies and really doubling down on them and saying, you know, that this is kind of more important to her than than the mainstream Mormonism that her and Charles have been practicing and living together. At one point, she disappears for a couple of months. He has no idea where she went. We know now that she disappeared to Hawaii and was telling people that she knew there, you know, I'm the leader of the 144,000 that's prophesied in the book of Revelation as the sort of people who will survive the apocalypse. And I, and I want to recruit you to be in that group. And people are saying, what are you talking about? You know, so she, she was not being quiet about her views. And, you know, she, Charles Ello files for divorce at a certain point, but then she returns back to Arizona. He revokes that and says, you know, I think that there's a chance that we can fix our marriage. And that's really what he tries to do. Now, tell us about this fateful meeting of Charles Day, or pardon me, uh, Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow. Where do they meet? And tell us about those circumstances. So it's it's very interesting. I mean, you could picture it as that Chad Daybell drove south through Utah from where he lived in Idaho. And Lori Vallow and a friend drove north from Arizona. And they were all going to attend a conference in the, the small city of St. George, Utah, there on the Arizona Strip. It was a meeting of a organization called Preparing People. This was a, a, a organization that's holding these prepper conferences. And Chad Daybell was going to be there. He was selling his books and he was speaking about his near-death experiences. And so there was this pretty distinct scene in the book where he's standing at his table selling his books, just like he usually would. And here comes this just beautiful beauty queen woman walking up to his table and wants to introduce herself. And she says that she's a huge fan of his books. And that meeting is just such a fateful meeting. It's a meeting that would just change so many lives because right then he just felt that he had met the woman that he wanted to be with for the rest of his life. Now, remember, Chad Daybell is married. He's been married for 29 years to the same woman, Tammy, and they have several children together. And Lori's also married. She's married to Charles Vallow. Their marriage is very much on the rocks at this point, but that's when they meet and they would continue to meet that they would meet these prepper conferences and I mean, it seemed to, from the text messages and the evidence that I've seen, it seemed that they were starting to have an affair. What they, because they both held these radical fringe ideologies, they applied something much bigger to that. Lori has spoken out in these groups, but she talks about a doctrine and covenants, a section 98. Tell us what she said with that or what it says. She started to so she started to have these home meetings with other women who were interested in 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 fringe ideologies. And at one particular meeting, she is recorded giving her te- a testimony of her faith, and she starts to say that you know she she tells the, the the people at the meeting about her 
belief that her ex-husband, Joseph Ryan, was molesting her children, that she was just absolutely broken by the fact that she had to share custody with him, that she believed him to be a monster and a monster she just couldn't get rid of from her life. And she starts to say that she's just going continually to the temple and to the Book of Mormon and to the Doctrine and Covenants, this Mormon scripture, to understand what is happening to her and, and to seek relief and advice. And in this meeting, she talks about that she believes that she found an excuse to kill someone within Mormon scripture. And she she tells the women at this meeting, I was going to murder my husband. I believe that I had found, you know, within Mormon stories that I that I could kill him. That would be okay in the eyes of God. She says that she didn't do it because she didn't have a murderous heart. And the notable thing about this is that Joseph Ryan had died at this point. She did, she omitted that from her story as she was sharing her testimony of faith, but he had been found dead in her in his apartment at this point. And it was very notable that, that she was saying that. You fast forward to winter 2019, and Charles arrives back in Phoenix after a business trip. His truck is gone and he can't get into his own home. So he calls police wondering where his wife and his kids are, and he's concerned. This is bizarre. Tell us what happens. Yeah, this is really when you start to see Charles and Lori's marriage just crumbling between their fingers. So like you said, Charles gets home from a business trip. His truck is gone. He goes to his house. He can't get in. The locks are changed. And and he calls the police. And, you know, this is all on body camera footage is how I wrote it in the book was he was telling the officer, like, look, you got to understand, like, my wife is, is there's something happening to her. She started talking about all these crazy ideas about about being a warrior, that she can control me or she can kill me with her mind and that she's the leader of the 144,000. And the, and the police officer is like, I'm sorry, what are you talking? about like he's very confused and you start to see the desperation in Charles that he knows that something is going on and he's trying to get people to pay attention that he could see that there's there's something dangerous here and and it's kind of the beginning of, of people not listening to him pretty quickly after that is when Lori disappears for a couple of months and then you know things things really start to fray more from there what happens next in this tragic saga so by by this summer, You know, after Lori's return from Hawaii, Charles says, "Okay, I'm not going to seek a divorce. We're going to work on our marriage. Things just continue to fall apart. You know, it's it's just it's just beyond what's fixable. And you start to see Lori continue to make threats against him. She starts to assemble more groups on the side, a group of women who get together and they try to use the power of their own prayer and their own faith to kind of, you know, cleanse dark spirits from the earth. They start to assign, you know, say some people are light and some people are dark. And of course, Lori really focuses on her husband, Charles Dell, and said, he's dark, he's possessed by a demon. We need to cast out the evil spirits from within his soul. And these women get together and kind of get in a circle and hold hands and, and do this. You know, again, we are so far away from Mormonism at this point. This is just a sort of bizarre thing that they're doing. And she really turns everybody against Charles. And Charles realizes the only way I think that I can get Lori to come to her senses is is for me to get the church involved because it's the only thing that she cares about and it's the only thing she'll listen to. Right. So he hatches a plan in July of 19, 2019 with, with her other brother, so not Alex, that they will kind of have something of an intervention, that they're going to record Lori talking about these very fringe things she believes and that the idea is that they will play it for somebody in the church and try and get her excommunicated or, or get, the, get the church involved with waking her out of, the, out of this trance they believe she's in. Lori gets wind of this plan to come over to their house in the morning because they're, of course, separated at this point. She calls in Alex. This is the brother that is seen as the guardian angel and who tased her her other husband. Right. He is there in the morning on in morning in July when Charles shows up and pretty quickly a scuffle unfolds and that ends in Alex Cox shooting Charles Vallow and killing him. And that is 
it's it's very unclear whether or not that happened in front of Tylee and JJ, the children, or if they were outside. The clip it was clear that some they knew something happened though. And what happens after that is the police are called and Alex and Lori tell a story of self-defense that Charles was coming after Alex, that he was attacking him, that he was gonna attack her sister. And so they shot and killed him in self-defense. And the notable thing is that story really works. Much later, investigators look into that again and realize that they were fed a story. Let's use this as an opportunity to stop for these messages. So you say police realize that this self-defense story doesn't add up forensically and just the story doesn't add up at all. So what do police what police, what do police do? The police, you know, they, they bring Alex in, they bring Lori in, they bring Tylee in as, you know, 16 year old. They all come into the station and they give their version of events. They say that Charles was, you know, came in, he was being, he was yelling at Lori. He was being really aggressive with her that, you know, at one point, Tylee Ryan, her daughter tried to get between Charles and Lori with a baseball bat and that, you know, Charles yanked the bat away from Tylee and she fell on the ground. And you know, this is just sort of horrible story. And the detectives really, they bought it. They, they thought that, you know, Charles was being very aggressive. He was threatening people with a bat. He was saying that he was going to, you know, hurt Lori potentially and that they did what they felt like they had to do. So that, that story really worked and no one was arrested. Charles, you know, was dead and and that was that. And they started really just going about the business of their lives again. And in Lori's case, that meant she continued to hold these meetings that were not okay to have in the eyes of the mainstream LDS church. She continued her relationship with Chad Daybell, which was, you know, something that she was having at a long distance. She had a special cell phone that she talked to him on when she was still married to Charles. She started to make plans to leave Arizona and to uproot her life and her children's lives and move north to the small city of Rexburg, Idaho, which she would do in late August of 2019. And along with her would come her, her children, Ty Kylie and JJ and her brother, Alex, and also her niece, Melanie Boudreaux. She really, they were, they all lived, moved north to Rexburg and they all lived in, in this townhouse community. And it was just a few miles away from where Chad Daybell lived with his family. What were the ideas that Chad and now Lori were espousing once they were official together? Yeah, a lot of things. I mean, the so one, one big thing that was a big plot point in one of Chad Dable's fictional books that he sort of said, yeah, it's fiction, but it's also things that I've seen in my experiences speaking to spirits on the other side of the veil. He started to say that potentially that Rexburg, Idaho could be the new Zion. Zion is kind of, you know, Mormon vocabulary for the promised land, for the for the sort of place that will of peace and safety that that will keep everyone safe in, in the end times. So he started to believe that, you know, that that wouldn't be Utah, that it would be Rexburg, Idaho. He had moved his family up there. And then by the time, you know, Charles Vallow was dead and he had this clear relationship happening with Lori Vallow, he was telling people, come up to Rexburg. We're going to assemble Zion here, the people of Zion, and we're going to be ready in case something happens. So start you start to sort of see these people trickle up to Rexburg, potentially to assemble Zion. Lori and her children, Alex, other people start to come up to attend conferences and look at real estate and start to to decide if they're going to move their lives there too. What happens that Lori takes JJ out of school? So when they get to, to Rexburg in early September 2019, the family goes and they visit Yellowstone and they take a bunch of photos. This is near Yellowstone National Park. And those photos are the last time Tylee Ryan is ever seen in early September. And then in late September, Lori has some friends in town who are looking at real estate in the area to potentially move there. They're attending some some classes and conferences together. And Lori tells those friends, you know, JJ is getting really out of hand. He's getting to be more than I can handle by myself. Charles and Lori had adopted JJ and he it was on the autism spectrum and had, had really high needs. Before they moved to Arizona or from Arizona, excuse me, he attended a special school. He had a service dog. He had, he had a lot of infrastructure built into his life that would sort of 
meet him where he was with his autism. But that was really uprooted when they went to, to Rexburg. There was no school that he could go to. He went to a regular public school. He didn't have a service dog anymore. And he was, he was you know, a big kid with, with some really high energy. And it was, it was getting, she said it was getting to be too much. And she said that for her, the thing that sort of was the straw that broke the camel's back for him, which she believed that he had become a dark spirit, was that he'd climbed up on top of the counter and up onto the refrigerator and he knocked a, a picture of Jesus on the ground. And wow. that was that was a major moment for her when she started to see her son not as her son anymore, but as someone who had been possessed by a demon, just like she had said about Charles Fallow. And that was the last time that JJ was ever seen. He never went to school again. She took him, she withdrew him from school. And that's something you can do in Idaho and say, you're going to homeschool them. And that was it. That was the last time he was seen. Witnesses said that she had said something concerning children with her faith in that they were only loaned to us and that they were adults. Maybe you can tell us, explain further. Yeah. In one of her meetings that she had with these other women where they were sort of entertaining these fringe scriptures and ideologies or not fringe scriptures, but interpreting Mormon scripture in really fringe ways. She had said, you know, you don't have to worry about your children. You need to remove that worry from yourself because they're actually adults. They're adults in small bodies and they they don't really need us. They're just loaned to us temporarily and we'll all be together in the celestial kingdom, but you just don't need to worry too much about them. It seemed like a strange thing to say, you know, uh, maybe what does that even mean? I guess it came, came, those words really came to have a much darker meaning when you know what happens with the story that maybe she was not just reading LDS scripture, trying to find an excuse to kill her ex-husband, which, you know, we don't know whether or not that what happened to Joseph Ryan, if he was killed or if he did die by, you know, natural causes as the medical examiner's first thought. But it appeared she was reading scripture to also maybe find, find ways to sort of wiggle out of these roles that she had to fill in her life. Because the reality was, you know, Charles Vallow, she may have thought he was possessed by a dark spirit and his brother, her brother killed him. But the reality was she was a single mother all of a sudden. Chad Daybell was in a marriage of his own with his own children. And he was still in that marriage when Charles died. And here she was all of a sudden needing to take care of a child with very high needs by herself, who is not getting the education that he needed. There is some evidence to suggest that perhaps he was not getting the medication that he needed. So she had she had a real she had a real situation on her hands with caring for her son, and maybe was reading the scripture trying to to understand how she could work her way out of that. You're right that October nineteenth, two thousand and nineteen, uh, Tammy dies. Uh, tell us yes. about the particulars. This is Tammy Daybell. This is Chad's wife of 29 years. She had a cu strange couple of weeks, you know, at the end of her life in October of 2019. She wrote on Facebook one day that she had come home from a meeting of the Relief Society, which is the LDS Women's Organization, where she had been preparing freezer meals. So, you know, meals that you can get out of the freezer after a busy day at work and pop in the oven and, and dinner's on the table. She came home one night and got out of her car and there was a man dressed in all black standing by her car and all of a sudden started shooting at her. She starts screaming and calling, you know, Chad, come out here and help me. And she wrote on Facebook that she thought this was just so weird that it must have been a paintball gun. It was just some prankster with a paintball gun that was scaring her and, and ran away when she screamed. Investigators now think that that was Alex Cox, and that actually was not a paintball gun. That was a real gun. But, you know, he missed. And Tammy kind of went back to the business of her life. She was working at, as a librarian at a local elementary school. And then on October 19th, there's really conflicting accounts. But the long and short of it is that Tammy Davell, somebody who was very in great physical health, you know, this really perky, beloved woman, just died. Her Chad has told conflicting stories about how that happened. In one account, he said all of a sudden she just dropped dead and and he called for their eldest son and he came in the room and there was his mother just half in the bed, half out of the bed, but clearly dead. Another account is that Chad said he woke up in the morning and she clearly just died in her sleep which is, you know, not really normal for a woman in her 40s. Oh. So the unique thing about this, though, is that when the family, the Daybell family, called the police and the medical examiner, they asked whether or not they wanted to have an autopsy, if the family wanted one. That's very unique to Idaho. 
you don't necessarily have to have an autopsy if, if you don't want one. And, and they said, no, they said, we don't want to have an autopsy. And that was that. Tammy's body was, was taken to Utah to the place where her, she and Chad grew up and she was buried in a graveyard that Chad Dabo actually used to work at as a grave digger. And that, that seemed like it was the end for her, the end of her story. You talk about November 5th, 2019, there's a marriage. Tell right. us about this wedding in Hawaii. Two weeks after Tammy Daybell's death, Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow are married on a beach in Hawaii. They're wearing white clothes and purple lays around their necks, and no one is there. They don't tell anyone that they're getting married. It's just them and a photographer on the beach. So they get married and come back to Rexburg. Lori moves back into her townhouse and Chad goes back to live in his house and they tell his children, we just got married. And even they're very shocked. You know, most of Chad's children are grown. They're, they're old, much older than, than Lori's children. And But even they're like, hang on, you just, you just got married. Our mom just died. So they're very surprised by that. But ultimately, you know, they are their LDS kids who, who listen to their father as the leader of their family and they, and they accept her as their, their new stepmother. Let's introduce Kay Woodcock. This is Charles's mother, I believe. Yes. And she has some concern about the children. What does she do? Yeah. So Kay, Kay Woodcock's relationship is actually really kind of complicated. Kay is Charles's sister and she's also the grandmother of JJ right, Bell. Right. So sort of the, the very long short story there is that her, her son was not able to care for JJ for whatever reason. And Charles and Lori adopted JJ and right. raised him as their own. So Kay has really maintained a very close relationship with JJ throughout his life. You know, he's this very precocious kid and her and her husband, Larry, just love him. There's just these beautiful videos of them singing with him and just, just the most loving grandparents and, and grandchild relationship. But the last time they've heard from JJ is on a FaceTime call in August of 2019. The call only lasts a few seconds and then they don't hear from him after that. And they're very bothered by that. And they can't get a hold of Lori. They can't get a hold of JJ. They don't know what's going on. And so Kay starts trying to figure out what the heck happened. Lori didn't attend the funeral for Charles. She seemed very, you know, nonplussed over the death of her husband. And Kay is getting very suspicious. And she starts poking around, you know, doing what anybody would do to try and understand how they can get to their grandson. And what she comes to understand is that Lori has moved, that she's not in Arizona anymore. She's in Idaho. And it's so notable the way that she figures it out. She somehow gets into Charles' Amazon account and sees that Lori has been using the Amazon account to ship packages to Rexburg, Idaho, of all places. And she's thinking, Rexburg, Idaho? Oh my God, Lori moved. So she calls the police in Rexburg and says, look, I haven't heard from my grandson in, in months and I'm so worried. Can you go to this address and do a welfare check? We think he, you know, we haven't heard from him. He's missing in our minds. And that's kind of when the story begins. The detectives go and knock on Lori's door and they say, where's your son? You know, we, we've heard he's missing. And Lori lies to them, says, oh, don't worry about it. He's just visiting a friend in Arizona. I'll have them call. This whole mess will get figured out. Don't worry about it. They don't hear anything. And the next day they go back to her house to see if they can get eyes on JJ again, get an explanation for where he is. And then Lori's gone and everyone has disappeared at this point and they don't know what they're dealing with. Eventually, they have someone that's close to her, previously very close to her, speak to her on the phone, and that call is recorded. Right, right. A good friend of Chad and Lori, somebody who's been something of an acolyte, who's been at these meetings, who's been following them, who's who was entertaining the idea of moving to Rexburg. She decides to call Chad and Lori because she knows something is up. And Lori, when Lori said, don't worry about JJ to the police, he's with my friend in Arizona, she gives this woman's name, and her name is Melanie Gibb. And Melanie says, hang on a second. Why are you pulling me into this? Where is JJ? I don't understand what's going on. So she, in December of 2019, she makes a call. She reaches Chad and Lori. They put it on speakerphone and they have this very interesting phone call where Melanie Gibbs saying, where are you guys? Where is JJ? What is going on here? And that pretty quickly turns into a conversation of Lori getting very upset that she's being questioned, that her, that her intentions, that her words are being questioned. And ultimately, she doesn't say where they are. They just say that they're really far away from Idaho, that JJ's safe. 
and that she shouldn't be questioning what Lori's telling her, that she says she's safe. She says the children are safe, and that's all that, that Melanie needs to know. So what happens next in this search for these children? So at this point, you know, the police in Rexburg in December say, hold a press conference, and they say, we've got two missing children on our hands. And this is when, you know, the story starts to come into my life, is that I see these press conferences where they're saying, we've got two missing kids, Lori Vallow's missing, Chad Daybell's missing. We don't know what's going on. We need the public's help to try and find these people. A couple of months pass, and it's not until February of 2020 that the police track her down. Her and Chad are in not a bunker somewhere, not a dusty, you know, survivalist compound. They're in a condo in Kauai, in Hawaii. They're relaxing on the beach. They're essentially on vacation. And there is no evidence that the children have ever been there with them. Pretty quickly, you know, Lori, you know, they talk, the police talk to her. She still won't say where JJ and Ty Lee are. And so they extradite her back to, they arrest her and extradite her back to Idaho. They put her in a jail cell and the police are still searching for many months, trying to figure out where these children are. What happens next in terms of a potential arrest for these people? Yeah, so Lori's in jail. You know, she's not saying anything. The case is just real kind of stagnant. It seems like in the eyes of the public, at least, there's just no answers for where these children have gone. In June of 2020, the FBI and the police in Rexburg show up at the doorstep of Chad Daybell. Mind you, he's he's living at home. He's back he's back in Rexburg, and they say we have a warrant to search the property. You're gonna have to you're gonna have to stay here while we start searching. And they have dogs with them who start sniffing around the the backyard. Not a not your traditional backyard. This is a very large open field. And pretty quickly, those dogs hone in on two areas and the bodies of. Tylee Ryan and J.J. Vallow are unearthed from two graves. They're, they're, they're dead, obviously, and they are in the backyard of Chad Daybell. That is when Chad Daybell gets arrested, and really this is when the case starts to roll forward. Chad's in jail. Lori's in jail. They have two dead bodies. They have, all of a sudden, are looking at Charles Vallow's death. They're looking at Tammy Daybell's death. They're looking at all these different things that have happened around them and trying to understand how it comes together. So charges aren't even filed for another year after that. When they do, they're very serious. Both Lori and Chad are facing first-degree murder charges, conspiracy to commit murder, and prosecutors are seeking the death penalty for them in Idaho. COVID put a monkey wrench into this whole thing. What is the status of those hearings now? So it's been quite a lot. You're right. Um, COVID kind of backed up the entire court system, including in Idaho. But for a while, Lori Vallow was not deemed competent to stand trial. She didn't understand the charges against her. She had to be restored to competency in a mental health facility. But the saddest now is that it's running full steam ahead toward a trial. And that trial will occur in Idaho, in Boise, Idaho, in January of 2023. And that's where they'll face charges Um, unless things get moved. I mean, it's a death penalty case. It's a big, big deal. And these cases tend to get moved now and then, but it's seeming like it's good. It's, It's headed to trial in January. After this incredible read, I know this is not the way it was written, but what is the cautionary tale in all of this, if there is any? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a few things. I think that, you know, given my expertise, I could pretty quickly see that this was a story of religious extremism. You know, it's it's in a way, it's sort of wrong to call Chad Debo and Lori Vallow Mormons because they're taking an ideology and, and twisting it in a new direction. So I think one thing is that despite years and years of trying to sort of purge this extremist fringe from the LDS church, it's, it's still there. There's still more work to do. I think that people don't like to talk about these stories because they start to think, well, oh, this is what, you know, people are going to think this is what all Mormons are like which is obviously obviously not true at all. But there has been a history of these fringe folks within in in the culture of, of Mormonism that have, have done some really horrible things. So that in itself isn't a cautionary tale, but I think that what it what is is this sort of reckoning that we're having nationwide with extremism and what that looks like. Mm-hmm. What my reporting over the years has found is that, you know, I think for a long time, 
we all thought that that racism, that extremism would be very recognizable to us. You know, it would be somebody burning a cross or wearing a hood or, you know, swastika right. armband and things like that. And it certainly is. But I think what this story shows us is that extremism can also look very normal and living normal lives, but really nurturing ideologies that are that are not only fringe, but dangerous. And that's, that's, I think, a very difficult and sobering thing for all of us to consider that extremism could be sitting next to us in the pews at church. And that's something that we need to be really vigilant about, about understanding these ideologies and where they come from, what their history is, and watching for it. And that's not to just, that's not to patrol people's religious beliefs or their ideologies, but I think no. it's to really understand when people are talking about things like violence, you know, why are we as a society so numb to that? When Lori Vallow said, I was considering murdering my husband, you know, on that recording, you don't hear anybody say, hang on a second, what? Like, that's crazy. They, they just keep listening. And I think that this is really a big meditation on our own tolerance and numbness to, vi to violence and, and why that is. And we maybe as people need to, to understand about when violence is fanned by religious beliefs or or it's something that's that's seen as very casual what that might do in the end because there's some real victims here real tangible victims that i think need to be thought about much further beyond the tabloid headlines that this case has kind of garnered absolutely and i think too that it's evident that this is more a philosophy that more and more people are embracing especially given this last two years of isolation and and some of the things that were said by people like chad daybell seem to ring true to people that would again are on the fringe and ready to believe mm -hmm. yeah yeah and, and it's really opportunity you know extremists see an opportunity in times of fear and mm -hmm. and that's that's kind of when you know people come along and offer solutions that are that are grounded in in violence and hate and things like that we've seen that so much with covid and yeah I think you're right. I think that's kind of what what's happening in this story was there were people who capitalized on other people's fear to benefit themselves. Thank you so much, Leah Satilli, for coming on and talking about When the Moon Turns to Blood, Lori Vallow, Chad Daybell, and the story of murder, wild faith, and end times. Thank you so much. It's been an extraordinary discussion with you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you and uh, good night.